Well, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? I'm not a big snow guy. I was really kind of disappointed when we lost all our snow yesterday with that rain. It was beautiful coming down on Friday. And the trees were spectacular, and now it's all gone. Well, I was thinking, you know, I was kind of wrestling through my head to give everyone a $100 gift card, you know, for Christmas. But I thought, what do they really want? They want a Christmas joke. And so I'm like, you know what, I went with a joke. And um, <laughs> and that wasn't even the joke. This is going to be a doozy. All right, so what did the doctor say to the gingerbread man who broke his foot? What did the doctor say to the gingerbread man who broke his foot? No, that is a, that's actually pretty good, though. I have to say, that's pretty good. Are you guys ready? I recommend icing it. <laughs> All right, let's pray. <laughs> Father, I um, thank you for this morning. I just want to pray that your Holy Spirit would fill every centimeter of this building, that the words spoken are yours. And uh, I just really pray, Lord, as we read from John, that you would just really um, just enter our hearts. And I just lay it all before you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in John 14, and this is part of this uh, three-part series we're doing for Christmas, and this part is the truth aspect of John 14. Um, Rachel had kind of alluded to this last week, but we had gone to New York City. Um, my sister-in-law ran in the New York Marathon, and this is going back probably, I don't know, at least 12, 13 years. It might even be more than that. Um, and it was Halloween weekend in New York. Uh, it was quite an exciting time to be there. And uh, one of the things that we got to do is we went through Chinatown. Now, if you haven't been there, it's very interesting. Uh, New York is r unlike any place I'd ever been before. It is really a microcosm and a melting pot of the entire world in one city in the United States. And this particular part of town you walk down this main kind of thoroughfare where there's restaurants and you'll see all these people selling, um, well, basically counterfeit goods, okay? So you can buy any imaginable um, pseudo leather bag that you'd want, but there was someone who was with us on this trip who wanted to buy a watch, okay? So you can go there and of course they've got all the counterfeit Rolexes, Omegas, you name it. And so this particular person bought an Omega watch. And I'm a watch guy, and I'm like, can I see it? I want to look at it. And I will be honest with you, when I looked at it, it, it felt right, and I put it on, and I'm like, yeah, it's pretty cool. It says Omega on it. But it wasn't until I took it off, and I started analyzing the case and the crystal. And then when I turned it over and I looked at how the bracelet was put together, I immediately knew, okay, now the truth is starting to come out. Because whoever crafted that watch, wherever it was, in some sweatshop overseas, the metal was rough. There was scuff marks all over the case. And you could just tell that all they were worried about was how it looked on someone's wrist, not when you actually were to analyze it. It said Omega. It looked like an Omega, and I think if you were to go into a restaurant or you were at a party and someone just kind of glanced at your wrist, they'd be like, wow, that guy's got a pretty nice Omega watch. But the person wearing it knows the truth. It's not an Omega watch. Well, Christmas is a little bit like that Omega watch because a lot of times we get wrapped up into the holiday spirit, and I like Christmas. Actually, my favorite time of the year is Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving because I have Christmas to look forward to. 
I think with Christmas, it's the anticipation of it that we get more excited about than it is the actual day. That's actually it is for me, because once it's over, I'm very, I kind of go through that, that seasonal kind of downturn. And when we talk about Christmas, there's this kind of tripod gift that God is giving us. And there's really kind of a battle going on at Christmas. It's a battle for our hearts. We look at things in the, the trees and the lights and the gifts and getting together with family, but the truth of the matter is Christmas is really comparing real versus fake. And when we are going to be speaking from John 14, I kind of envision it's part of that upper room discourse where you've got all the major players in one room. And Jesus is kind of explaining to his disciples, his friends, I'm leaving. And there's this transition that's going to have to happen for you once I'm gone if your faith is going to hold up to what you're going to be encountering. So in John 14, we're just going to kind of lay it out a little bit. We're going to be talking from verse 1 through 10. Jesus is sitting here in front of all of these guys. They're kind of having a meal. They're chilling. And he's kind of revealing the fact that things are going to be shaken up in a pretty dramatic way. Some of them are going to be asking him questions. Many are confused. And you can tell that the gears and the wheels are moving in their head. Like, what on earth are we going to do? What, is you, what are you even talking about? We thought you were going to be here uh, for the duration probably of our lives. We wanted to travel with you and impact the world in a way like no one else could. So if you have your Bibles, it'll be up on the screen. Um, we're going to be reading from John 14, and of course we're going to start with verse 1. But when you listen to this dialogue, kind of put yourself in their place, okay? I know a lot of times when I hear these passages and stories of the Bible, I tend to get kind of judgmental. Like, well, how can you not figure this out? It's so plain to see. But think about it. They, they don't have the world global view that we have. They don't have a fully published Bible that's 2,000 years old that we've been able to listen to experts talk about. They're living this in real time. And I have to be honest, I would be one of those people. I think I would be confused, I would be hurt, and I would be kind of tugging on Jesus saying, what, what are you doing here? You're kind of blowing up the whole system that we've established. All right, so in verse 1, it says, Don't let this rattle you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. There is plenty of room for you in my Father's home. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I am on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so you can live where I live, and you already know the road that I'm taking. So he's alluding to the fact that he's coming back for the church. Thomas said, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? Well, Jesus said, I am the road, also the life, also, or excuse me, also the truth, and also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. So remember I was talking about how there's kind of this tripod gift that Jesus is trying to present them, okay? The tripod gift is really the ultimate truth, which is the, the Trinity, okay? He's basically saying, look, there's a father, I'm the son, and later on when the church is established in Acts, there's going to be the Holy Spirit, the ultimate helper when Jesus leaves here. Now, they have no idea what the church is yet. They don't know what the Holy Spirit is, but they will. There's going to be this great transformation that's going to happen with Pentecost and a wonderful helper, a spiritual guide, um, a spiritual force to be reckoned with is going to be a part of their mission. This is a time where the relationship with Jesus transitions from physical. They physically see him. They're with him. They've eaten with him. They've seen him do miracles. They've watched people just touch his robe, and all of a sudden they're immediately healed. And it's transitioning to a spiritual 
reality, a spiritual gift. And it's going to take time for them to absorb. And of course, Jesus is patient, but I think sometimes when I see how he interacts with the disciples, you kind of see that human part where it's like, I mean, how many times have I had to say this? You've seen this before. Why aren't you getting it? And I think a lot of times as believers, and everything that I'm saying today, believe me, it applies to me. I mean, absolutely 100%. As human beings, even though we're saved by grace, we're Christians, we tend to have this, um, it's kind of like an out-of-alignment car. It either tends to go to the right or to the left. No matter that there's that line down the road, there always just seems to be this leaning to go a different way. And we're no different. We're human beings. We're sinful. And for some reason, truth just seems to kind of be something that we repel. It's, it's not easy to accept it. A lot of times what happens is truth winds up, it strips us bare. It reveals flaws, and it holds us accountable. And those are all things we don't, we don't want. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I don't, I don't like it. I, matter of fact, we were going uh, shopping yesterday, and uh, Rachel and I were talking in the car, and I don't know how this kind of got up, but it was something, and I just said, I, I think it was some of the things that were going on in our culture and the decisions that were being made. And I will tell you, during the whole COVID thing, it wasn't necessarily the masks or those, there were a lot of irritating things. I refused to be controlled by others. And I had to kind of come to grips with that. And I think sometimes when we wind up having to confront the truth, whether it's being honest with ourselves, being honest with God or the scriptures, let's just be honest. We don't want to be controlled. And it's hard. There's different types of controlling. There's the physical controlling or paying your taxes. But then there's that different, deeper controlling where Jesus is like, look, I'm not going to force you to do it. But if you want your life to be on the straight and narrow, you're going to have to give it to me to release that control. And for someone like myself who has like an OCD tendency, giving up that control is like, pretty much having all my teeth taken out of my mouth. <laughs> but let's be honest, if we, were the, if we were honest with ourselves, none of us really want to be controlled, do we? No, not at all. All right, so there was a story that I heard, and I found it kind of fascinating. It was about, this is years and years ago, about a man who was in solitary confinement. And of course, when you're in solitary confinement, you're by yourself in a cell. And in this case, this man's cell was dark, pitch black. And for whatever reason, he had a marble that was like the only possession he had in this cell. And to kind of break the monotony of the day, he would take the, the marble and throw it against the wall. And of course, when you're not using other senses, or like say vision, other senses become more prominent, right? Like your hearing, touch, um, you just have a different, it, it just, it grows. And so when he would throw this marble, sometimes it would ricochet off the wall and it would come back in his lap. Other times it wouldn't. It would go all, all over the place and he would have to kind of figure out like where is that thing? He could hear it on the, whatever the floor was made out of. Well, one day he decided to kind of um, spice things up and instead of throwing it at the wall in front of him, he threw it up at the ceiling. And he's waiting and waiting, but the marble never hits the floor. And he has no idea what happened to the marble. So at first he's sitting there, sitting on the floor thinking, okay, well, there's no window, there's no ledge, um, I know there's nothing up in the ceiling, there's no whatever that could catch this thing, where is the marble? And this thing, this, it's driving him crazy. And it's almost to the point where insanity starts to kick in, okay? And so he's doing all the calculations in his mind, what on earth could have happened? 
and I'm going to come back to that story. <laughs> All right. So in John 8, we're going to follow up with this upper room discourse conversation. One of the things that I want to just share with you as a person who's grown up in the church, when I was a kid, I grew up in a very, very conservative home and a very conservative church. And a lot of times we would hear people at the church or my parents, they would be very uh, almost obsessed with the behavior of the world around us, okay? My mom was uh, steeped in the moral majority movement when that was really at its height in the late 70s and early 80s. One of the things that I constantly thought about when I was littler is I'm like, look, I get it that the world is evil, that they're going to do things that the church is not going to approve of, but you got to understand, they don't, they don't know any better. They don't know the truth like the church does. When I hear in the scriptures that judgment starts in the house of God, that, um, that's a very sobering thing for me because I think what God is saying to us is, hey, look, I see what the world's doing and I'm not happy about it. But there's a different level of grace that I have for them. And the church, you guys know the truth. You've seen the truth. You've heard the truth. You should know better. And when I start to see the big C church leaning towards some of the things that are happening today, I have to just kind of shake my head and be like, well, what Bible are you guys reading? So I was listening to this um, or reading about this Christian writer who went to uh, a place where they trained agents on how to differentiate real money from fake. And so he went into this with all these kind of predisposed paradigms of what he thought was going to happen, and everything that he thought was going to happen didn't happen. He thought it was going to be almost impossible to tell the real from the fake, that they were going to uh, focus on counterfeit money, like they would just lay out on a table all the fake money, and you got to study it and see what, what that looks like, and then you'll be able to tell what's real and not. That didn't happen at all. There were a couple bills laid out on a table, real ones, and they're like, we want you to study those and only those and nothing else. We want you to try to make that truth real for yourself. Not just look at it, we want you to touch it. And so when he touched the real money, it didn't have the same feel as the fake. The fake has like a waxy feel to it. The real money had like a cloth feel to it. But they're like, well, that's, that, that's not even enough. Now what you need to do is you need to actually grab it and you've got to make it your own. Now, I want you to tilt it. And what wound up happening was is there was this kind of holograph that if you were to really analyze the bill, you could, almost, you could see this holograph in the money that there's no way a fake bill could ever have. Well, then finally, you had to make it your own, and you had to look through it. And all of a sudden, you could see this ghost-like watermark. And I don't know if you've ever been, I'm sure all of you have, where you've been in a retail place where you'll give them a 20, right, or whatever, and, or a 50, and they'll take like a mark, and they'll take like a marker and see if there's a chemical reaction. But most of them will hold it up to a light, and there's a strip that goes right through the money. I don't know if many of you know that, but our government's able to like scan the money with that. I think, I think the technology's there where they could scan like a case of 50s and they'd know exactly what was in there. See, this is a situation with the disciples, and for us. The disciples are kind of given a glimpse of a community that they're not even aware of yet, which is the Christian church. We live in this time of grace that is quickly coming to an end. They have no concept of a church. They don't have a concept of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is like, look, I'm just trying to prepare you. This is what's coming. It's not enough that you've been walking with me for several years. 
you've eaten with me, you've seen me do miracles. I have to believe that being around Jesus in human form, there has to have, had to have been some type of spiritual energy or aura that these guys were privy to. And isn't it amazing that they're able to see God in, in the human flesh, but they're still confused and they're still struggling. This isn't on Jesus. This is just part of being a sinful human, our sin nature. We know the truth. We see the truth. We touch the truth. But when it isn't our own, <laughs> that truth really doesn't become practical. I can know that something's there, but if I don't take it for my own, what good is it? It doesn't impact how I live or how I treat people or how I view myself or God or my need for God. Does that make sense? So you've got this gift that he's trying to give them, and it's like, you got to be honest with yourselves here, guys. I can't force you to embrace the truth the way that I've shown it to you until you make it your own. All right, so back to that prisoner. So he's sitting there trying to think of what happened to this marble. And eventually, the mental toll takes its course. Insanity just drives it home, and the prisoner eventually dies. So the guards come in, and to show you how old this story is, they come in with a lantern, and they remove the body. Just before they close that cell door, the guard just, I mean, like just briefly sees this little, this like reflection in the corner of the room, and he just looks up. And so they go and they inspect it, and there was a spider web. And the marble had gotten caught in a spider web. The prison guard looks to his partner and says, how in the world did that spider get that marble in that web? And they couldn't figure it out, and of course they removed the marble. See, that marble represents truth, okay? The fact of the matter is, is that the spider webs of life, the dark cell that we find ourselves, even though we're saved by grace, we're still sinful people. Those webs, that dark cell, it hides the truth from us. That truth, that marble never left that cell, right? I mean, he's sitting there thinking, the prisoner, the marble's gone. It was never gone. It was always there. But he couldn't see it because of the decisions that he made by being in a dark prison cell. And there are things in life that catch us off guard. The marble was always there and it never left him. And it's the same thing with truth with us. There are marbles of truth that God gives us. The Bible, the gospel, the Holy Spirit, our conscience, he promises when we ask for wisdom that he will give it to us. But how many times do we actually act on that? When we're going through tough times, when we're dealing with family issues, our own personal things, do we really seek God in that? Did the disciples seek God in that all the time? They were struggling. How about when the Israelites were taken out of Egypt? All the unbelievable miracles that are talked about 2,000 plus years Later, now we talk about them. And look at how the Israelites struggled then. A whole generation had to die off before they went into the promised land. It isn't what we see. It isn't the miracles that we see. There have been times where I've thought in my own life, boy, if I could just see an angel or if I could just talk verbally to God and he would respond to me back, my whole life would be completely different. No, it wouldn't. It would not. I would still struggle, I would still doubt, I would still do the same sinful tendencies. You see, those marbles of truth are there, but we get stuck in a dark cell with the cobwebs of life. It never left, but how much time and effort do we take to look for it? When I heard that story about the prisoner, I thought, well, did he actually like get up and try to find it? Did he, like, jump on every corner to see if maybe? He didn't. He just thought it was gone. 
And it doesn't even make logical sense why it would be gone, right? You're in a, a four-wall cell with nothing but blackness. It has to be there. But he didn't even take the time to look for it. And part of me wonders, like, if he had done that and scaled around the whole thing, taking his hand up, would he have found it? I think maybe he would have. When we think about the disciples and this conversation that I'm going to just read to you, think about that. Think about if you were in the room with Jesus, how would you react? Would it be confusion? Would it be disappointment? Would you just leave all together and be like, this Jesus thing isn't for me? So let's, let's read the last part of it. So Philip said, Master, show us the Father, and then we'll be content, okay? You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand. To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word in a divine act. So a lot of times we sit there and we try to create this formula of an infinite God, but we try to do it in a finite way. There are mysteries that we will never understand. That's why it's called faith. That's the whole reason it's called faith, because some things just are not going to be explained. And I work with a group of people where everything is science and um, technique and everything else, but there's no faith in it. And a lot of times as Christians, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to prove how in the world can this be true. You're not going to be able to do it unless you make it your own. I remember when I was talking in the last message, and I don't know if some of you kind of bristled at this. We were talking about a lot of different things, and I just said, I can't explain to you how I know. I just know. And that doesn't mean, I'm not trying to be arrogant, like I have some uh, magical powers. That's not what I'm saying. There are things in my life that I've just made my own. Like I've just, I've said, God, You've got to make this real to me. I know it's not going to be exactly the way I want it, but I need you to give me a way where I can absorb this in my spiritual life. And without a doubt, no matter what anyone says to me, no matter how they treat me, I'm going to hold, fat, I'm going to hold steady and I'm going to be confident because my identity is in you and no one else. But a lot of times we get so caught up with what other people are doing or what they think. And I don't say this to sound kind of aloof, but of course, if I were to offend someone, I would want to make sure that I apologize and make it right. But when it comes to spiritual things, I just don't care what other people think. Because when I look at the scriptures, when I ask God to reveal it to me and I make it my own, it doesn't matter. I just don't care. Because God has given me that gift of truth and I just hang on to it for dear life because there's nothing else here that's going to give you that. When I think about a verse that really sums it up, um, it's out of Romans 10, 17, okay? So we talked about that truth is a matter of faith, right? So faith comes by hearing, okay? And hearing by the word of God. So the ultimate truth, the living truth, is from the Bible. And I know a lot of times I've heard Christians who debate whether Jesus even had to die or was really the true Savior of the world. And they'll say, well, Chris, I mean, how can you, how can you say that? I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Jesus said that he's the way, the truth, and the life. I didn't say it. And you've got to take it up with him if there's an issue with it. So I don't expect the world to accept this. But when I see others, and I'm not saying it's necessarily here in the river, but in the Big C Church who struggle with it, then I have to question, you've heard the truth, you've touched the truth, you've seen the truth, but has the truth 
have you absorbed it to make it your own? And you look at some of the decisions that the disciples made. I mean, you had Doubting Thomas. You had Judas who sold Jesus down the road for some silver coins. These were people who lived and breathed and ate with him, did life with him, and they struggled. And the truth was right before them. So when you think about the actual Christmas story, Truth sometimes isn't exactly how we expect it. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, some of the uh, second and third movies of Indiana Jones. The first one for me was the best. The other ones are kind of whatever. But there's one in there where Indiana Jones has to do this test, okay, and he's in this cave. And I think, it, you know, of course, it, it's these ridiculous things where if you don't pick the right one, you know, you're going to die or get eaten by alligators. And he had to go into this cave, and there were all these, like, gold chalices and cups and all these things. And the guy said, pick the one you think Jesus would have drank from. And so, of course, there's all these fancy goblets, and you think, oh, I mean, the, it, it, this has got to be the one that Jesus drank from. And Indiana Jones is looking and looking, and he goes, what would a Jewish carpenter drink from? And it was a clay, basically like a small clay pot. And he picked it, and the guy's like, you've chosen wisely. See, we can sit there and think, well, Jesus is a king, and he's Lord of all, which is all true. Surely he would drink from a very fancy cup. But he didn't. It was a, a humble vessel that was chosen, which is probably very true from what he drank from during his time here on earth. See, we can somehow think we know what truth is, but if we don't seek God's wisdom, if it isn't absorbed into our very being, we're going to choose one of the gold goblets that's um, encrusted with all sorts of stones. You know, I've said this before, but it is so true. The longest distance in the world is a foot long, and that's the approximate distance between our brain and our heart. We know a lot of things. We live in the information age. We're bombarded with things all the time. You could probably pick hundreds of books on Christianity, hundreds of books on making your life better as a Christian, three steps to this or ten steps to that. But a lot of times I ask myself and I ask others that I talk to, well, when was the last time we read the Bible? When was the last time that we read the words, the scriptures, where all these books supposedly are supposed to be foundationed off of? When we really want to make this real in our life, those are the things we have to do. This isn't just for you guys, it's for me. I can't say that I read my Bible every day, but I try. There are times where there are difficult people or personal struggles or even thoughts that come into my head. And I have to just take a moment and I have to say, is this really of God or is this perhaps the enemy? or one of my own personal leanings? Or is the culture influencing me? Or is my sinful nature just kind of taking over? Sometimes we got to take that pause. The Holy Spirit is something that we all have access to. There is the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have these three helpers that are there available for us at any time we want. Sometimes I have to ask myself, why don't I lean on it more? And the answer is, I don't know sometimes. Just because I don't want to. Because maybe I don't want to seek the truth. Maybe it's too painful. I learned something just recently um, about the world's view of the Trinity. And I didn't know this, but, and this is not a knock on the Muslim faith. There's a lot of fine Muslim people. 
But I don't know if you've ever seen a military person. I work with a lot of people who worked in the military, and I've noticed on some of their hats, when they, when they wear like an army hat, in the back, it'll say infidel. Now, of course, we know that that's kind of a buzzword that's been used many times during a lot of the Gulf Wars, and I always kind of thought that was just kind of a, you know, a dig. Oh, no, there's actually a reason why they call us infidels. The reason why is because they only see one God. And to believe that there is a trinity, a three-in-one God, that's considered a major sin. Well, in the Christian faith, that's what we have, three-in-one. That's the reason why they call us infidels is because that truth, that perspective of one Savior, a Father, and a Holy Spirit is so objectionable to cults, to different faiths, that it is considered a major sin. And this is exactly what Jesus is talking about in this passage, that triangular truth. The world will reject it. But as Christians, that's, that's our whole world. Without that, there's nothing. So you have to look at it from a sense of there is only one truth that we have to make our own. Now, we live in this time of division and truth, and we don't even know there's fake news and the whole deal. And I think about a, a quote that Charles Spurgeon, he's, he's, one of my, he's kind of my, one of my heroes. He had this quote that I just loved, okay? <laughs> and it fits so perfect for today. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. The world knows what the truth is, guys, and we do too. I just ask as we kind of go through this holiday season, there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things that will pull us away from the faith. And I'm just going to ask that you would just make this a, a Christmas that is real on the spiritual side and not so much on the physical side. The gifts and everything are great, but the real peace is going to come right here when we accept it, when it becomes our own. And I'll be honest, I struggle with that, and I'm sure everyone else does too. But think about that gift that Jesus is describing to these disciples. We have the truth. Make it your own. Open the gift and use it. I think you're going to find that there's going to be a peace and it's not necessarily going to be a worldly peace. It's going to be a spiritual peace because all the troubles, all the things that we deal with in life, there are pains that I have in my life. And this is not going to be easy for me to say. I've just accepted they're just always going to be there. They're never going to leave. And once I came to that reality and I just said, Jesus, I'm giving it to you. I know you'll probably use that pain. I'll probably come into contact with people who deal with this pain. It still didn't, it still hurt, but it gave it purpose. And all of those disciples had different personalities, and look what wound up happening. He established the church through those people that impacted millions, if not billions, I'm going to leave you with this. This is out of John 16, 13. And Jesus is saying, when I, basically, when I'm leaving, this is what I need you to rely on. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. So the things that the Spirit hears is from God. We better be listening. On the day that he was betrayed, 
he um, broke the bread and opened up the wine and had a meal with his disciples. It was the, the ultimate um, representation of the sacrifice that he was going to make. I, I can't even imagine the pain and the, just the uh, anxiety that Jesus had to have felt knowing what he was going to face. And as we take part in this communion, I just ask that you please examine, please examine your heart. If you don't feel comfortable, then I just, I ask that you pass. But please take this with the most somber and, and, and just, I guess, <laughs> seriousness of what Jesus did for us on the cross, the ultimate gift of giving his blood, that beautiful blood that allows us to know him and have eternal life and to be the hope of the world. So when you feel led, come on up, please. <clears throat>